but the call from EDG. We saw them with Clearlove down at the Krugs. They were ready to help him do that, right? And then they went up top. Right after they did their side of the jungle camp, they just took out Mountain in his jungle, took his red, and made his life hard. We're going to see what the analyst desk has to say on this and get their take on Edward Gaming's first win of the series. Thank you, Riv. Not to be outdone by our first series of the day. Both of these teams just coming out hard in the beginning, slapping each other around. I mean, this was a bloodbath of a game. It was reminiscent to game one where both these teams faced off. In the beginning, it was kind of even. You know, we could see how AHQ could make a comeback, and then eventually EDG just burst through the gates and rolls over. It, rolls them over. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of this game came down to pick Banfairs once again as well, and I really have to question the TF pick here. It was picked into a Cassiopeia, and as soon as you have cleanse on the Cassio, you just win the matchup. You absorb the first yellow card as it is, flash forward, get the stun down. Pawn even mucked up the level six quite substantially. He missed the Q, Eden, and then just altered for fun and wandered away, but he just still had way too much pressure in the lane. Crumbs, yeah. I want to get into the uh, Cassiopeia itemization real quick. I know you had something to say about that. Yeah, so she went with the tier first, then finished the Abyssal Scepter, then a Death Cap, then completed the Seraphs, and then got Boots, which to me is more of the realistic build. Obviously, you know, snakes don't have feet, have hats, have heads that can wear hats, Rabidon's Death Cap. Obvious. Thematically but the, correct. But the build makes sense because they don't want to dive. They want to get dove into against a Sivir, a Sejuani, a Maokai. They just want to defend themselves. So lots of dive. He has up and front burst damage. You need to tell that to Koro, man, because there was one member that definitely <laughs> wanted to dive in this game, and he was going hard in the paint. Every single time he could get anywhere near the AD carry, he was going for it. Yeah, and you were talking about picks and bands. Nautilus jungle, man. I personally love Nautilus Jungle. I talked about it a few weeks back, like way when it was just like Cinderhulk was coming out. I think this is a great jungler to fall back on. It provides so much zone control, so much CC. It has four types of CC. You can hit everybody on a team with it if you just change targets. You're constantly AoEing. And if Deft is one of your main carries, you get to protect him. Also, his early game, people think it's very weak. His E is extremely strong, and his passive adds extra damage to his attack. You see it on the invade when they go for the level one, that you're not expecting that type of uh, damage from a Nautilus, and he's able to just make up for the deficit where it's hard for a Nautilus to escape. He's got movement speed quints. He's able to chase after people if they do escape from him and get his passive off. So I think the Nautilus pick is really good when you're protecting those backliners. And especially if you plan for it, because everyone says, why would you pick it over anything else? Well, they banned everything yeah. else, so then he has to it's pick it. It's a good and fallback. If that is what you have as a fallback, I completely agree with you. That was next level getting in there. Didn't even go for the Nunu, went for something new. I have to say, I really do like to see the Rek'Sai and the Gragas banned out, <laughs> simply because we get to see where junglers are going to go in this tournament if those are not available to them. Rek'Sai has dominated so far this tournament. And now we see Nautilus being the fourth pickup for this for these junglers. I think the story of the game came down to the level one. So AHQ started off by smiting the Gromp and giving all of the XP to the bottom lane. Now that would have been a great strategy had there been a regular lane. Oh. AHQ on screen right now as you're talking about them. They're working out their strategy see if they can come back in this next game. I'll let you continue we'll on probably with your point about, though, that, about level that level one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so they went for a level one that gave a lot of ex quick experience to the bottom lane so that they don't miss a beat in, of any experience. So they would have had a huge lead. EDG, though, accurately reads AHQ thinking, okay, they really camped the bottom lane, go for the lane swap, and then has the better jungle path to invade the red buff. Thresh just sits there. Level one waits for the jungler and top lane to just invade, gets a free kill, and then eventually AHQ gets a little bit greedy, goes top and dies hard. And even more impressive is how they set up the turret dive off that, because it looked like it was going to be a 4v3 kind of up there, but what Koro did is he actually pushed them off the turret and made it a 3v1 turret dive. It was just so smart. I do want to jump into our replay 26 minutes into the game. 4 for 2 for EDG around the Baron spawn. We're going to give this one to you, so we're going to pull that up on your screens right now, and you can take it away. Yeah, and one of EDG's strongest points in their game is their Baron control, and they started off any small advantage. The advantage advantage you got here, you think it's 5v5, everyone knows what's going on. There is no advantage. Mountain doesn't have his ultimate, so if we roll this one out, you'll see that he can't throw it. I'm like, where's Mountain's ultimate? Oh, it's still on cooldown. They chunk it out with Kalista, the double smites. No hopes for a steal. 
Um, unfortunately, AHQ overcommit into the pit. I think if they had left one more member outside to deal with death, all this damage wouldn't have come through and it would have gone a little bit better. And EDG, they love to force these fights. They love to go to objectives. And when they have double smite Callista, you're not going to steal it away from them. It's so hard to do so. And then they clean up after they pick it up for themselves. And then they just start snowballing from there. And that's how they create these advantages. You talked about EDG. When they have a little bit of an advantage, they want to snowball it more. They want to get as much as they can. And when they want to fight you, they don't wait for it. They don't wait for the hard engage. They force something that you have to fight them on. And I love that play style. We're going to be seeing more of that this series. Now we saw their thirst for the Baron, though, almost bite them there in the end as they go for it with just the two members. So hopefully they can stay away from some of those tendencies. We'll see if Edward Gaming can keep the momentum on their side in Game 2 versus AHQ. You're watching the 2015 Midseason Invitational. If he can handle himself in the mid lane, AHQ has a chance to win. Their bot lane in the bot lane. This is pretty this green. Is be tough. Koro under the turret. That's not where he wanted to be. Westor is able to pick up a kill now. Glacial Prison locks up three. Mountains coming up big in this fight. Albus has eyes on Pawn. So does oh. Westor. They turn it. Ziv is on to death, and he's not going to be able to do much, but he throws Mako to Westor. That could finalize him. They both go down, and the onslaught of shadows comes through. Oh. 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 Game one.